I'm so happy to see you all, and so happy to study the book of Ephesians together. Today, the title of this first lesson is Spiritual Blessings in Christ. May we pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your great grace through our Lord Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us and for his mighty resurrection from the dead that destroyed death and opened the way to life and immortality and your glorious kingdom. Father, thank you that you have blessed us through Matthew's gospel study and the book of Jonah. Now, please speak to us through the word of Ephesians. Please give your Holy Spirit to each of us and please help me share this message by your grace. Clothe me in your forgiveness, in your mercy, in your love, and please bless this study. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Our key verse is chapter one, verse three. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. May we read this verse together, please? Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Regarding Ephesians, John McKay, a former president of Princeton Seminary, said, to this book, I owe my life. It led him at age 14 in boyish rapture to passionately confess Christ among the rocks in the starlight. He said, I saw a new world. Everything was new. I had a new outlook new experiences, new attitudes to other people. I loved God. Jesus Christ became the center of everything. I had been quickened. I was really alive. This experience can be ours through the study of Ephesians. Ephesians tells us who we are in Christ and describes the glorious church with Christ as its head. It is the heavenly realm on earth. It is a new society created by God through Christ. It is characterized by life instead of death, unity and harmony instead of division and isolation, righteousness instead of corruption, love and peace instead of hatred and discord. Doesn't it sound beautiful? Through this study of Ephesians, may our Lord grant us a clear identity in Christ and spiritual understanding of his church. In today's passage, Paul praises God for the spiritual blessings he has given us through Christ. Everyone wants blessings. Do you want blessing? If you want blessing, raise your hand. We all want blessings. But you know, the Bible tells us in this passage, God has poured out his abundant spiritual blessing through Jesus Christ. He has given them to us in Christ. But many Christians are not aware of it. They live as though they had never received any blessing. Oh God, bless me, bless me, bless me. I never received any blessing. Bless me, bless me. But we have to realize how much God has blessed us. Let's think about his blessings one by one. 
so that we may not live in spiritual poverty, but enjoy the rich spiritual blessings God has given us in Christ. Amen. Part one, praise be to God. Amen. Look at verses one and two. These are Paul's opening greetings. His greeting is short and concise. He identified himself as an apostle of Christ Jesus, and he became an apostle not by his own decision, but by the will of God. Paul addressed the Ephesians as God's holy people, the faithful in Christ Jesus. From a human point of view, they were not perfect. They were still vulnerable to the greed and immorality of typical Gentiles, but from God's point of view, they were holy, set apart for the Lord, and very special people. Paul prayed for them to have grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace. These are God's precious gifts to those who put their faith in Christ. Those who have grace and peace in their hearts are strong, stable, steady, and faithful, no matter what the situation may be. After his short greeting, Paul begins to pour out his heart in praise to the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It is the triune God who initiates and accomplishes cosmic reconciliation. This triune God is so transcendent, he is hard to understand with our human reason. So Augustine said, don't try to understand the Trinity, just believe. In verse 3, Paul begins to praise God. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. In the original Greek text, verses 3 through 14 are all one long sentence. Verses 3 through 14, one sentence. It was an outpouring of praise from Paul. He could not stop in the middle and take a breath. He had to just keep praising God to the end. Those who are full of praise and thanksgiving can do this. But those who are full of complaints breathe out their complaints from the beginning to the end. This hurts others and it's poison to the society of, of Christ. In the past, Paul breathed out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. But when he was changed after meeting the risen Christ, he breathed out praise and thanks to God with all his strength. When we think about his situation, he was in prison. How could he praise God in prison? Usually we praise God when everything goes well and our hearts are greatly moved and for one second we praise God and then forget about it. So often. But Paul praised God. Praise God in the midst of hardship. His body was in prison, but his soul was in heaven. Why did he praise God like this? There's a reason. Verse 3 says, it was because God has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Here the verb tense is very important. The words has blessed are past tense. God has already given us every spiritual blessing in Christ. 
He's not waiting for us to improve before giving the rest of his blessing. The problem is, we're not aware of his blessing. But God already gave it to us when we believed in Jesus. Do you believe in Jesus? You're blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. In the past, we were cursed in Adam. But now, we are blessed abundantly in our Lord Jesus Christ. We are rich, not just like a millionaire, like a trillionaire or more. However, sometimes we behave like beggars or stingy people who think they have no blessing from God. There was a woman named Hetty Green who lived in the 20th century. Her fortune exceeded $4 billion in modern equivalents. She earned the nickname the Witch of Wall Street. But she lived as though she was very poor. She never turned on the heat and never used hot water. She ate only oatmeal from McDonald's at a discounted price. To save money on soap, she instructed her laundress to wash only the dirty part of her clothes. And most surprising of all, when her son Ned broke his leg, she tried to have him admitted to a free clinic for the poor. Like this woman, many Christians who have been abundantly blessed by God live as though they're very poor. They have the mentality of stingy beggars. We need to realize how much God has blessed us in Christ. Then we can live happy, generous lives like spiritual trillionaires. Wow, unlimited resource to give and serve and love and be a blessing to others. In verse 3, Paul talks about every spiritual blessing. In the midst of mystery religion and human philosophies, many were tempted to seek something in addition to Christ. But Paul emphasizes every spiritual blessing has been given in Christ. They needed nothing more. When we feel that something is lacking, what should we do? We should not look elsewhere, but realize more deeply, God has already blessed us abundantly in Christ. He has given us every spiritual blessing in Christ. This indicates there may be spiritual blessings and material blessings. People usually praise God when they receive material blessings. Yet these are temporal. Though we may need them, they cannot last. Spiritual blessings are eternal blessings. They last forever. They are the most valuable blessings. God has given us every spiritual blessing in Christ. God has given us every spiritual blessing in Christ. So, we have abundant reason to thank God and praise God all the time. Let's think about what these blessings are. Part two, 
every spiritual blessing in Christ. First, he chose and predestined us for adoption to sonship. Look at verses 4 and 5. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. May we read these verses together, verses 4 and 5, please. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. These verses show that God's salvation plan was rooted in God himself. When did it begin? Where did it begin? before creation in God's heart. Before anything was made, God had already chosen his church, and I believe each of his children, and predestined us for sonship through Jesus Christ. God made a decision in eternity that he would choose us and adopt us as his children. He did not do this with reluctance. Oh, I know you're going to be a troublemaker, but I'll adopt you anyway. He did this with love. Great love. It was God's plan. It was God's decision and God's pleasing will conceived before creation. Why are we sitting here today? Because God made a plan before time began that each one of us would be saved by faith in Christ and come together and form this community. Amazing. Salvation originates with God, not us. And salvation comes from the Lord. To some, predestination seems to nullify man's freedom of choice. So someone may think, if I am predestined to be saved, God will do so no matter what I do. So I can sin freely. On, on the other hand, one may think, if I am predestined to be condemned, I will perish no matter how much I struggle, so I should sin freely. The conclusion is the same always, I should sin freely. Or one could think, since God already decided who will be saved, I don't need to preach the gospel. In fact, these thoughts stem from human reason which cannot penetrate the mystery of predestination. They lead to determinism, which is a perversion of God's truth. They're false. Sometimes we Christians think we chose God. Oh, tell me your salvation story. Well, I chose God. Well, maybe it's somewhat true, but we chose God because he first chose us. Jesus said plainly, you did not choose me. I chose you. He had to tell the disciples because they were confused. Oh, we chose Jesus. We followed Jesus. But he said, no, I chose you. There is mystery here. It's mysterious. We cannot fully understand it. But the point is, our salvation 
does not originate with us. It originates with God. If it originated with us, we would always be nervous and uncertain and fearful. But our salvation, listen now, originated with God and came from God, not from us. So we can have assurance. And this brings great comfort to our souls and gives us true rest. Then for what did God choose and predestine us? For what? It was adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. In Roman law, whenever someone was adopted, that person inherited the full rights of a son, such as father's good name, all the wealth of the estate, and the right to reign over the household. When someone was adopted, their big question would be, who is adopting me? If it was a good family, an orphan who was abandoned and lonely and needy could suddenly change in status to a son in a loved family. For example, a young African-American boy from Tennessee was abandoned at age seven. He was traumatized. He was put into various foster homes but always ran away because he was not loved. He was even homeless for a while. But when he entered high school, a classmate's mother had compassion on him. She was a wealthy white woman from a good family with many social connections. Eventually, she persuaded her husband and natural children to agree to adopting the boy. Suddenly, his status changed to a dearly loved son in a good family. He became stable and his grades improved and they discovered he had a natural talent to protect his loved ones. And he became a football player, a left tackle whose job is to protect the quarterback. And one time he wasn't quite sure what to do and his adoptive mother went to him and said, you just pretend that that quarterback is me and this guy on the other side is trying to hurt me. And he drove that man all the way across the field. <laughs> he eventually went to the University of Mississippi because his adoptive mother told him that in other schools, they have dead bones under the football field. And he was very much afraid, so he went to Mississippi, where they don't have any dead bones under the football field. The boy in this story is Michael O'Hur, and the adoptive mother is Leanne Tui. Their story was recently told in the popular movie, Blind Side. This story illustrates what it means to be adopted by God. Before God adopted us, we were miserable, like Michael. We were lonely, abandoned, slaves of sin, and tormented by evil. We had no hope, no meaning, no direction. We were spiritually dead, but God, had mercy on us and God adopted us as his children. Who is this God? Verse 2 says, God is our Father. A Father. Our Father God is loving. You know, his love is deeper than the ocean, higher than the mountains, wider than the farthest horizon. It's unfathomable, infinite. 
never ending. As we sang in our song at the beginning of worship service. And God demonstrated this love by sending his one and only son as a ransom for us. God loves us. God loves you. And he loves me. This God is generous. He's not stingy. He gives lavishly, freely, generously. He's rich in mercy. He's full of wisdom and imparts this wisdom. He is the almighty creator God, eternal and infinite. We cannot describe all of his attributes here, but this God, this God adopted us as his children. Now we have an intimate love relationship with this God. So we should understand predestination for adoption to sonship is not just some systematic guarantee of going to heaven. It is entering into a relationship with God. And in this relationship, God helps us grow. And to help us grow, sometimes he gives us divine discipline out of his love. And his purpose is we become holy, blameless in his sight. When we are adopted as his children, we become heirs. Verse 11 says, we were made heirs. We have an inheritance. It's more than a trillion dollars. It's the kingdom of God, which never perishes or spoils or fades. God has adopted us as his children through our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. Praise God. Second, redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. How was our adoption made possible? Look at verses 7 and 8a. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. What does redemption mean? What does it mean? To be bought back, right? To buy back, redeem. To be liberated from slavery. When we are free, we don't appreciate how precious freedom is. But if we lose it, we really appreciate it. When I went to North Korea last year, I sometimes felt like a prisoner, always watched, always told where to go, what to do. Though I loved to be there and pray for the people, I must confess I was happy to get back to the United States. Freedom. The Bible says we were slaves of sin. We did not do what we wanted to do. We did what we hated to do. And even though we hated it, we could not stop. Many young people are addicted to video games. And even though they fail in their school studies, they can't stop. Others are addicted to sexual desires, or alcohol, or drugs. Some are slaves of anger, bitterness, or hatred. Some have a chronic habit of holding grudges, and this imprisons them. How can we get out of these bondages? To be redeemed requires a price. The price is not money or community service. It's life. The wages of sin is death. 
So we have to die to pay the price of our sin. People think sin is enjoyable. And I'm just going to enjoy it a little bit and after enjoying, come back to where I was and go on with my life. But when they try to sin, we become slaves of sin and cannot escape. The famous German theologian Karl Heim said, we have a key to the door of sin. But once we enter that door, we are trapped because we don't have the key to get out. But God has the key to get out. The key is Jesus, God's one and only Son. Verse 7 says, we have redemption through His blood. In order to redeem us, Jesus shed His blood on the cross. Blood. Why blood? Leviticus 17, 11 says, for the life of a creature is in the blood. The blood makes atonement for one's life. Blood and life are mysteriously connected. If we shed too much blood, we die. If our blood becomes contaminated, we become very sick and die. So our kidneys, which clean our blood, are very important. But our kidneys cannot clean our blood from the infestation of sin. Sin requires the shedding of blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So the Israelites sacrificed many animals. But it was only temporary, only a shadow. It looked forward to Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, sinless, had to sacrifice His life and shed His blood on the cross. It was the only payment that would satisfy the demand of sin. Jesus' blood has power. It has great power because He is God, because He was sinless. That blood has power. It can redeem from any bondage of sin. It can break the shackles of any addiction or habit. In Jesus Christ, we are redeemed. We have freedom in Christ. What a blessing. What a grace of God. In this way, God redeemed us as his children. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. And he did this in his love. According to his rich mercy and grace. Third, he revealed the mystery, verses 8b through 10. In verses 8b through 10, we find another spiritual blessing in Christ. It's not just personal, but given to the Christian community, the church. It says, the mystery of his will to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. He makes known to us the mystery of his will. Paul sometimes says, listen, I tell you a mystery, and reveals to us a mystery. Usually when he uses the word mystery, he refers to Christ or the gospel, and Christ himself is the mystery of God. But here he uses the word mystery in a larger context to reveal the bigger picture of what Christ has done. He says, God has a great plan to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth. In this world, there are so many distinctions, so much segregation, so many conflicts. 
We cannot solve these conflicts with human effort or ability. And it seems impossible that there can be unity. But this verse says, His will is to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth. Christ is a center of spiritual gravity who draws all things to himself. In this way, he brings unity. Fourth, God's purpose in salvation. In verses 11 through 14, Paul explains, God gave the same blessing and had the same purpose in salvation for both Jew and Gentile. But chronologically, it was given first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. And he expounds in verses 13 and 14 how Gentiles were brought into God's blessing and how they can be sure of it. This was very important to them. They always felt like the Jews are chosen, the Jews are blessed, the Jews were known before, God, before time, but who are we? We're just an afterthought in God's mind. But this verse says, they too were predestined by God and chosen by God before the beginning of time. Paul explains that when they believed, they were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's presence in our lives guarantees that we are God's children. He tells us we are God's children and testifies with us. Verse six says, to the praise of his glorious grace. And verses 12 and 14 repeat the phrase, to the praise of his glory. This refers to both Jew and Gentile respectively and tells us God's purpose in redemption. In the past, we were objects of God's wrath and grieved God due to our sins. But God redeemed us through Christ to restore God's image in us, that we might be for the praise of his glory. Now, when God sees us, he finds pleasure. He's happy to see us. Wow, there's my son Matt going to Northeastern to teach the Bible. I'm so happy, God says in his heart. Wow, we are redeemed to the praise of his glory. To people we may be nobody, but to God, we're very special. God says, Helen, you're really beautiful, wonderful. I love you so much, and I'm happy with you. In Christ, in Christ. By the same token, this verse gives us a purpose of bringing praise and glory to God. Why do we have to bring praise and glory to God and not to ourselves? God seems to be God-centered. He's making everything about himself. Well, that's right. For in fact, God is worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. God is the creator and the sovereign ruler of all things. He's our blessed redeemer who shed his blood for us. If we do not bring praise and glory to God, our thinking becomes futile and our foolish hearts are darkened. And we begin praising and glorifying something else. We become idol worshipers proud, corrupt, and miserable. God wants us to maintain God's blessing by giving praise to God and glory to God. When we do, there's harmony in God's world. When everything is praising, glorifying God, there's harmony. But if each created thing wants to glorify itself most, then there's disunity and chaos. For example, when people gather and have a conversation, if each one brags about himself, what happens? 
usually a fist fight breaks out in the course of time, they get so upset with each other. You selfish. I don't want to talk to you. Get out of here. No unity. But if each one has a clear purpose to glorify God and praise God and fulfill God's will, they have unity. They can have harmony. They can enjoy peace and be used greatly by God. Today we have learned that God has given us every spiritual blessing in Christ. We're rich. We are rich in Jesus Christ. He chose us and predestined us. He adopted us as his children. We're his children. We can call him daddy, father. He forgave all our sins. He reveals the mystery of his will, guarantees our inheritance in heaven, and uses us for the praise of his glory. Thinking of all this, we cannot but praise God. Praise God! Amen. Let's praise God from our hearts. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, you have given us every spiritual blessing in Christ. Please help us to recognize your blessings, to enjoy your blessings, and to live happy, joyful, fruitful lives generously giving and serving in your name for your glory. I ask in Jesus' name, amen.